This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Bingo. Four o'clock rock. ThinkTech Hawaii. <laughs> Wow, this is our energy show. Hawaii is a state of clean energy, uh, which is supported by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And today, uh, we have two distinguished guests. One is my co-host, that's Veronica Rocha. She's Renewable Energy Program Manager at the Hawaii State Energy Office. She's from the government, and she's here to help us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Really excited to be here today. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Veronica. Okay, and Rodney Chang, our distinguished guest, Renewable Acquisition, Acquisition Manager. Renewable Acquisition Manager. Boy, that has huge prospects from Hawaiian <laughs> Electric Company. Welcome to the show, Rodney. Thank you. Nice <laughs> to be here. So <clears throat> we have four questions. And we're going to begin with those questions now to explore renewable, renewable. Because she's renewable, you're renewable, mm -hmm. we're all renewable. It's a good thing. It always has good connotations. So why don't you ask the first question, wow. Veronica? Okay. So this show is really focused on utility scale so larger renewable energy projects. So my very first question is, we have this goal of achieving 100% renewable energy in the electricity sector by 2045. So Rodney, where are we with regards to achieving that RPS? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, we're uh, at about 26.5% as of date. And uh, so each year we keep getting uh, closer and closer to the goal. So the next milestone goal is in 2020 where we have to hit 30 percent so we that's think according to the PSIP yeah well and it's according to statute too oh so statute oh, oh yeah. okay okay <laughs> 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 so um, the PSIP you know it has a plan for us to hopefully exceed that goal if we can uh, but the minimum is 30 percent by 2020 okay. so we feel that um, given where we are today in 2017 we're about 26 percent uh, that we're on track for that. Oh, you'll have it easy, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here on Think Tech. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so How are you going to do it? So, you know, we're uh, making steady progress, and, you know, um, what uh, you may have heard of recently is, is a recent approval by the Commission for uh, three projects for Oahu, fairly large projects. Altogether, they're about um, 110 megawatts. So, some of you may remember. Uh, about a year ago, uh, Sun Edison had these three projects. Um, they had some financial oh trouble. Yeah. The PPA got terminated, but yeah. uh, NRD, uh, they picked up the project through the bankruptcy process, and uh, they approached us, and we were able to negotiate uh, a new PPA, all at lower pricing. Lower pricing? Lower pricing. So actually, the consumer benefited on all that deal. Yeah, in the end, it did. They did. And, um, Fortunately, we were able to get those signed, and, and uh, recently the commission approved those. So uh, those projects, you know, hopefully they'll um, be placed into service in the next few years, and uh, they'll add, I think, to altogether about 3% to the RPS. Mm. Um, so now you're at 29% or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll be at that just by those three projects alone. Oh, yeah. um, and the RPS does grow with other uh, aspects, such as... Um, rooftop PV mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. um, projects that are talked about in the PSIP as well. So, yeah. uh, you know, we are looking to get more um, and, uh, you know, we'll keep adding and bigger. number. What I, what I hear you saying, you know, we can agree or disagree, but is that big project is a big part of reaching these goals. That's and right. that that's a sort of a policy decision going forward. Maybe it's in the PSIP, but in any event, that's the fact. And um, we can expect to see more big projects to reach these goals going forward, am I right? That's true, that's true. Um, but we cannot forget rooftop PV. All, although they're all small individually in aggregate, they make up a huge uh, chunk of the RPS as well. Okay. Uh, but big, big projects, um, you know, each transaction, the bigger they are, then, you know, the, the more it contributes to the RPS. So, yeah. of course, each project has a different profile. You know, you've got solar, you've got wind, you got other technologies, and um, so some, you know, contribute more to the RPS than others. So, uh, but we're looking at, at, as stated in the PSIP, we're looking at all technologies. Uh, ah, so yeah. it's all, it's all, it's not just solar, and it's not just wind. It's anything that works, and it's, and you recognize that there might be a different pricing on different possibilities, but That's you right. want the diversity. Is that it? Yes, we want diversity. Um, 
you know, we want it to be as cost effective for customers as possible. So, you know, those have to be considered when evaluating these projects. Okay. Rodney, are there any uh, wind projects uh, that are, are either proposed or under development um, that are under uh, Hawaiian Electric's jurisdiction? So um, the one that people know about publicly is uh, one that the next wind project is going to be on the North Shore, the Nakumakane project. Um, so of Oahu. On Oahu, yes. And so uh, that's the one that most people know about. Uh, we did do a wind expression of interest for Oahu um, later, la last, in the part of last year. So we're still working through that. Um, so we'll, we'll see what comes out of that. What does that mean, a wind expression of interest? T tell yeah. us more. I've, never, I've heard uh, <laughs> RFPs or requests for proposals, but not yeah. quite that terminology. Can yeah. you? So, you know, what the intention then is, um, and a lot of people know this, but, you know, the, the federal tax credits, um, they're expiring faster for wind as opposed to... Oh, uh, too bad. Uh, yeah. Because when they expire these days, you have no assurance they're going to be renewed these days exactly. in this special, special administration. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so um, this was something that we felt we needed to look at. Um, and, and it's not a full-blown RFP, but uh, we recognize there's a need to try and see if there's some projects that are able to you know, take advantage of these tax credits. So we did you know, uh, put a request out there to say, hey, is anybody able to to meet these, uh, you know, take advantage of these tax credits and do a project here on Oahu? Um, so that's what we're working through, and uh, I can't speak too much more about no, that. No, but, but could you ask answer this question? Mm -hmm. Where an RFP needs to have the approval of the Public Utilities Commission, does a request for uh, yeah. uh, uh, interest, does that require approval also? No, it does, and um, any PPA requires approval from the PUC. Oh, but the, but the qu question is, when you send out the request for expression of interest, does that require PUC approval? No, so the way we couch that is was... Is that a good thing, Veronica? I, I actually had the same question, <laughs> Jay. We had so the same, see, we're on the same think yeah. Yeah. wavelength no, exactly. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so ultimately, what the request will have to be is, if anything comes out of this, is that it will have to go to the commission. And say, ultimately. Hey, yes, and say, um, you know, uh, we'd like to ask for a waiver from the competitive bidding framework um, because this was something that was uh, asked of outside of an RFP. And so th we have to give all the reasons, justifications why this should be a waiver. Um, and it's almost, it, it's similar to what we did a few years ago with the invitation for waiver projects, as you recall. Um, so again, that was one where back in 2016, as you recall, um, or prior to 2016, the tax credit was going to expire in the 2016. So we felt that we need to... Had to move that fast. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so we felt we didn't have time to, to do a full-blown RFP and so forth. So we did this uh, invitation for waiver project. So you know technically what, it was a waiver uh, request. Uh, yeah. we, 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 we will go down the questions, but, but I just had one other thing that just occurred to me that I wanted to ask you about. And that is, you know, from, from the beginning of the Clean Energy Initiative, I want to say 2008 or so, mm -hmm. you know, when, when Linda Lingle, Ted Liu made it happen, um, there was this whole notion that you would have third parties, that the utility would have third parties doing, you know, the design and construction and on contract, on PPA, right? Yes. Um, but is there any change in that now? Do you, do you see, for example, uh, a future in which the utility itself, in its own name, in its own ownership, will do these projects? Yeah, and uh, a good example is the recent West Rock PV project that was approved by the commission. And uh, so that's a 20 megawatt PV project that's on uh, Navy land. And so that was uh, one that was recently approved. And, you know, it, it's different uh, structurally that it's a utility owned project versus a third party. Mm -hmm. But um, my recollection is, you know, the equivalent PPA price, if it was a third party, it equates to about nine and a half cents. So that was a great price. Wow, yeah. And see, you can do it. No, I, you, exactly. You can do it cheap too. See, yes. yeah. <laughs> so our, I, our view is that whatever is good for the customer, yeah. and uh, so whether it be third party, it be utility owned, it should be 
whatever it may be. So all those possibilities are on the table. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question for you. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about PSIP. Mm -hmm. And for you know the audience that maybe is not completely familiar with this alphabet soup and energy <laughs> that we talk about, power supply improvement <laughs> plan or PSIP. So this um, wind expression of interest mm -hmm. um, was that uh, incorporated into the latest PSIP? Uh, not not verbatim, but um, the PSIP <coughs> you know incorporated um, some placeholder you know, resources, future resources. So if you look at it, it contemplated, okay, we'll get about 30 megawatts of wind, um, 180 megawatts of PV for, I'm thinking about Oahu. So, you know, that was the assumptions that went into the analysis and the modeling that gave the results that, you know, people see in the PSIP. So the PSIP recognized and contemplated that there's gonna be solicitations thereafter to get these resources. It may be 180 megawatts of PV and 30 megawatts, it may not be. And um, so it was based on purely an assumption at the time. And the assumptions include um, what the pricing would be. So, you know, they've said in many parts of the PSIP saying that, hey, this is just a, a plan. And uh, what really happens might be different. And uh, it should be based on, you know, what, what the market dictates when we do a solicitation. If the prices come in way cheaper for this instead of this, then, then we should pick this if it makes better sense for the customer. You always have to be scanning on new possibilities and better pricing. And no, a, a good example is um, if you look at the PSIP, um, there wasn't much discussion about, um, I call it hybrid projects, but PV coupled with storage. Oh, sure. Um, but that's kind of like the hot thing, hot thing right now, um, just over the past you know, six months plus. And uh, you look at KIUC, you know, they signed a PPA with uh, Tesla. Tesla and after that um, yeah. AES yeah, yeah. for hybrid projects. Yeah. So um, what the trend seems to be is where you know developers are coupling batteries with PV so that you can apply the tax credits to the batteries as well. Um, so you know in some cases that makes sense and uh, you know I'm guessing I'm anticipating when we do a solicitation we'll get projects like that as well. So these projects that you talked about, like Westlock and uh, the project, the wind project in Kahe, uh, the waiver projects, energy projects, do any of those uh, utilize storage or are they pure, uh, just renewable generators? Right, so NRG, Westlock, I'll talk about those two. Um, those are pure PV projects uh, currently. Um, but the commission recently said in order saying, hey, we encourage you to consider storage. Storage, yes. Yeah. Um, so don't, don't we agree to that? I mean, it seems to me, how can you build a you know a PV project without storage anymore? Because mm -hmm. you have to have storage somewhere in the system for it to be useful. Now. No, right. So what the PSIP said was, you know, it did contemplate uh, a lot of storage um, in the near future, but you know, not immediately. Um, but again, it, everything has to be looked at with fresh eyes, and uh, you know, if you know, bids come in and it shows that, hey, having some PV with storage makes better sense, then, you know, we'll have to justify it anyway. Do you foresee a time when you'll have all these non-storage kind of facilities out there, non-storage PPAs, and one great big battery in the middle? Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> I, I, I believe, and it, you know, it's kind of talked about in the PSIP that there will be um, large batteries on the grid. Um, that will help to to um, enable more integration of renewables, right? Because as as you know, storage helps you to shift shift uh, energy during different times of the day. Yeah. Um, as you know, we have overabundance of PV during the middle of the day. So using batteries to take advantage of that, as well as provide provide some grid stability as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. So along those lines, Rodney, a few years ago, um, if my memory serves me right, there was a procurement that the companies issued to procure, how much was it, like 200 megawatts of storage? Was it, is that right? I forget the number. But what's the latest with that? Is that something that's being procured, or is the idea more to couple that with future procurements of, uh, of large-scale utility projects? Yeah, I, I don't know the, the details on that, mm -hmm. but um, I know that process is still in play. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, you know, that was still the plan. And, the, and the, pro the procurement for that was a, they called it a contingency battery. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily a load shift battery, but, um, you know, there was a solicitation for that. And um, 
I don't know the specifics on that, but I understand that's still uh, going through the process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're getting, we're getting better at this, aren't we? We're getting better at sizing up our needs and, and creating, you know, PPAs and facilities and, mm -hmm. and working together on it. It's, it seems like it's happening easier now with less fits and fewer fits and starts and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and you're doing a great job, by the way. Did I mention that? <laughs> yeah. okay, Ms. Veronica Rocha. Thank you. Okay, and Rodney Chang, Hawaiian Electric Companies. Um, we're going to take a short break. We're okay. going to regroup. We're going to come back in one minute. And we're going to go on to more, more of the four questions. <laughs> we only got one so far. We'll be right back. Okay. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. Okay, wow, we're back. You know, if you, if you hadn't noticed, this is a hot show, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Rodney Chang from Hawaiian Electric mm -hmm. Company and Veronica Rocha, Rocha my uh, co-host for the show. Uh, she's the Renewable Energy Program Manager for Hawaii State Energy Office. So this is like utility renewables meeting state energy office renewables. It's all about renewables. <laughs> and we're, we're finding some very interesting things. So <clears throat> let's look forward. You had a question about looking forward, Veronica. Yes, and you referenced four questions. We've actually covered two already. Okay. The second one is not a mystery question. It's really about recent procurements. <laughs> right? So those mystery have been covered. Yeah. Idea, yeah. So the third <laughs> question is, okay, Rodney, now that the Power Supply Improvement Plan, or PSIP, has been approved by the Public Utilities Commission, or PUC, what can we expect next in terms of procurements, future procurements mm -hmm. from the utility. No, yeah. So you know, yes, the the PC recently accepted the the PSIP, so that's great. And um, you know, we, we were reading the order, and you know, it was clear that uh, the next step is for them to open the dockets, start the process to uh, allow us to do the RFPs. Uh, so that's something that we anticipated. Logically, you approve the plan, then you go out and get the stuff, right? Um, so that's what we're waiting for, and um, we're we're getting ready for that, and. Um, you know, some of the things that we've been working on in preparation for it is, um, and, and it wasn't something maybe you wanted to bring up, but, you know, we did a land RFI earlier this year. Yeah, please talk about that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, um, over my years in this department, um, there were times where landowners call me or developers call me. How long have you been in the department? Seven years. Okay. Yeah. Just, just check it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, landowners call you? Yeah. And they say, you know, so-and-so developer called me. Are they good? or a developer calls, hey, I need some land, who should I talk to? So um, obviously it's not something that we can just, you know, uh, No, I saw that a quick. press release on this very thing. And no, we, exactly. We so We talked to Peter Rossick of Hawaiian Electric about this very that's issue. That's right, very and he helped us discussion. get the information out. And so it, it was a way to get landowners connected with developers. So, um, you know, we asked landowners who are interested, hey, if you want to offer your lands for future renewable projects, send us information. And uh, we took that information, overlaid it with um, uh, our system information, mm -hmm. the uh, tra sub-transmission line, so that we can uh, provide that to developers. Very uh, valuable. It, that's right. You act as a facilitator, an exchange. Uh, that's right. Know, make it happen kind of person. I so. called it Match.com. I like the uh, Match.com. Yeah. <laughs> <there you go. laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it was a way to help facilitate that process. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, hope, we'll see how that goes. Hopefully yeah. it's useful. That's a good one. Yeah. And so, you know, that, because, you know, if you ask developers and landowners, it takes time for them to uh, engage each other and talk about things before they can actually put a project together. Yeah. Yeah. So we're hope hopeful that, you know, this process um, is easier by us doing that, and we'll want to keep enhancing and maybe do that again. Um, 
so we'll see. And um, in the meantime, we're, we're you know, anticipating um, you know, what we think the RFP will be structured, the process. You know, we are bound by the com competitive bidding framework, so we want to make sure that, uh, you know, unless told otherwise by the commission, that we're following the steps required in that. Why don't you just go out there and, and make 57 RFPs and just wait and see what happens and then seek approval of the ones you like and get to 100% by 2018? Uh, Sorry, uh, I, I had to <laughs> <answer. laughs> Yeah. 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 Well, that, yeah. that's one way of going about it. But yeah. um, then there's this, the PUC, uh, I guess, uh, way of doing things, right? Yes. So please clarify for me, who opens this docket to allow for the RFP to take place? Is it the companies or is it the mm. PUC? So we, we initiated by, we, we actually sent letters um, over the past year mm -hmm. uh, asking for, you know, requests to open the dockets to do the RFPs. Um, so, you know, we sent that and, um, you know, we wait for the commission to open the docket. And so, you know, Typically, if you follow the comp bid framework, there might be an independent observer assigned to that, to each RFP, and so we'll meet with that person and uh, go over what we think is the structure and the process of the RFP itself. The can, you, can you talk about the independent observer mm -hmm. for a minute? What is that? Who is that? Can Veronica be one? Can I be uh, one? I don't think so. <laughs> How about our studio <laughs> staff here? Can they be one? Um, well, I think you they have to meet be. certain qualifications, but... Uh, yeah, you know, they are uh, people who, um, you know, are the eyes and ears for, for the commission. And so they work with us to make sure that we're following, you know, whatever the commission might have stated when they open the docket or following the, the intent of the comp bid framework. Um, so they, at some points, they'll um, issue reports on what they believe is uh, their view of things. And so, um, you know, we've, we've went through this, through this before. Um, more recently with the geothermal RFP. Prior to that, there was one in 2008, I think, uh, for renewable RFP. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what's written in the comp bid framework. Um, and, and so, um, you know, if an IO independent observer is assigned, then um, that's how we work with them. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the reasons, too, if, if uh, there's an RFP where the utility is also bidding, you know, obviously we have to have some firewalls. Possibility of conflict, yeah. Exactly. So they keep an, uh, an eye out for that, make sure that mm -hmm. everything is, is right. So. Mm -hmm. so let's see. PUC opens the docket mm -hmm. in response to approving the PSIP and in response to your letter asking mm -hmm. for that docket to be open. Mm -hmm. Then you submit, is it your final RFP or is there a draft it's RFP? It's a draft. And is there opportunity for, for public comment? comment? That's Who right. gets to comment, actually? Is it the public or... Who gets to comment? Is it interveners? How does that work? Yeah, no, uh, so good question is the process, you know, the docket gets opened. We have a draft RFP, so it's technically a draft, and we issue that. Of course, we'll have the I.O. look at it first, and, you know, if it looks good, we'll issue the draft. And it's a public document that people can see. And, um, you know, we, we solicit comments. And, you know, more than likely we'll have a... Uh, uh, it's called a technical conference, but I, I view it as a bidder's conference where we talk about it, answer questions, and we got to run it a certain way so that everybody has access to the answers we give. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the public uh, may participate in it. They'll see it anyway, and so they, they may issue comments as well. So we take all the comments in, uh, review it. Um, we try and incorporate it into our proposed final RFP, and once we've done that, we've, we'll issue that to the PUC. And um, if we don't hear anything, I think for 30 days, then it's deemed final and we can go ahead and issue the RFP. You guys are so nice. I mean, uh, you know, I, I doubt this happened when you were first building power plants in the early part of the 20th <laughs> century. Uh, yeah, and you've you're gotten right. around to being transparent about everything, inviting everybody, total inclusivity. Mm -hmm. I remember in the RRP process, there were like 86 you know, stakeholders involved, and that took years, and it didn't work because so many voices. Yeah. You know, I mean, so my question is, you know, doesn't some of this mm, transparency-type bureaucracy stand in the way of moving to goals that Veronica is asking about? Yeah, I mean, that's reality. It, it is. Um, but, you know, there has to be a balance, to from transparency, yeah. Yeah. letting people comment on things, um, but also us trying our best to meet the goals that are law. 
So we have to do that. And um, Our hearts go out to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, appreciate it. This actually <laughs> takes me to the fourth question. I okay, the fourth question. Fourth question. <laughs> so, Rodney, um, how are the companies preparing the general community and also uh, developers for these upcoming procurements. And so just to put some like scale around the procurements, we're not talking about like 10 megawatts, right? Oh, right? How much are we talking about and how are you preparing general community and developers for the type of procurement scale that you're looking at? No, it, good question. And this, this has been a hot topic um, because we do have this goal for the state, but you know, people realize that there's going to be a lot of pro big projects all over the island. And um, uh, what we've heard loud and clear from, from communities is that they want more visibility um, because the way it's been done in the past is, you know, obviously for reasons of confidentiality, when we sign non-disclosure agreements with the developer we're negotiating with, we can't speak publicly about it unless they want to themselves. Mm -hmm. And so often, you know, the, the project's not made public until we actually have to file it to the commission for approval. That's when people hear about it. Some developers, though, they may choose to do community outreach beforehand, but that's, that's up to them. Um, but what we're looking at is trying to um, integrate into the RFP process a way to get the developers out there earlier before we execute PPAs. So what we're looking to do is propose in the process um, a requirement that the developer does some community outreach prior to executing a PPA. And, uh, you know, we got to work out the details on that. Again, that would be our proposal. It's going to be subject to comment by people who are stakeholders in the RFP process. It's going to be subject to the PC approving our process. Um, but that's the way we're looking at it. We're hearing loud and clear um, the community wants mm -hmm. transparency and they don't want to hear about it like way late in the game. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, that's what we're looking at doing. Yeah. Yeah. Strikes me though that, um, you know, earlier in the game, say going back to 2008 and a few years mm -hmm. after that, actually it was after the blush. Mm -hmm. The blush was in 2000, everybody was on board, but maybe by 2010 or so, you know, there was a little pushback. People said, oh, not in my backyard. You guys can do that, but somewhere else, not here. Okay, my, my guess is, and I really like your thoughts on this, my guess is that that's softened, that people are not so nimby today as they used to be. Am I right? Um, you can just say it, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it depends. And, um, you know, I, I think like certain communities um, feel like a lot of these types of projects, they'll call it infrastructure projects, seem to always be in their area. So obviously that, you know, that doesn't sit well with, with some of those communities. So. You know, I, I don't want to generalize saying that it's it's not an issue, and you know, um, so we're, we're trying to address it, regardless mm -hmm. what community. We just want to be consistent. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you you can see that kind of playing out. There was recently um, an ordinance passed with the city council um, for for future wind projects. So any wind projects proposed in ag or county lands, um, instead of a minor CUP, now has to go, go through a major. So that requires more community engagement. So I think you know people are beginning to realize that um, you know they, they need or they want to have more of a voice and more of a say in these projects, and uh, I see that happening. And um, so yeah, I don't think that's true for all parts of the okay. the state. You yeah. know. You know, I want to add to this part of the conversation. So in my experience, I agree with Ronnie. It, it, it does depend, but I feel that there is a thirst for not just being part of the decision-making process, but for seeing direct benefits to communities mm -hmm. that are impacted in some way by these renewable energy projects. So mm -hmm. to that end, you know, I really, uh, I'm really happy to see that HECO is starting to take steps towards that direction of further uh, really helping to engage the developers with the community. And what is part direct of the benefits, Veronica? For example, um, being able to uh, purchase part of the power plant, uh, being able to have uh, direct revenue derived uh, for the community for uh, from like the revenues that the developer would get. Um, and to be honest, these are just examples because ultimately the types of benefits that matter are the benefits that the community is looking for and that they deem 
fair for whatever it is that they're giving up. So Entitlements? You're talking about entitlements? I'm not sure what you mean we, by entitlements. Well, you know, build, build the gym for the kids. That could uh, be it. Improve the high school, um, what have you. Um, d d spend some money in the local community. That could be part of it. And, you know, um, so the last show of this series in September, so September 27th, uh, I'm hoping if I can um, get a, a, you know, a guest uh, to talk about what they are doing with regards to this subject on a very local level. So if this is something that folks are interested in, I highly uh, recommend that, that they tune into that show. Yeah, I want to yeah. be there. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Veronica, we're out of time. Oh, I am shoot. so sorry we're out of time, Rodney. There's right. much more to discuss here. You know, I personally had my own four questions, but that, that can come <laughs> next time you're on the show. So it's time for you to summarize or at least make a point for takeaway and leave, and leave our, our viewers with some <clears throat> really profound thought. Ready? Go. Shoot. Well, I don't know about the profound thoughts, but we have a very, we're the only state in the nation that has a goal of 100% renewable portfolio standard in the electricity sector by the year 2045. Towards that end, HECO has already procured quite a bit of utility scale projects. We're currently at 26% RPS. They continue to procure projects. NRG, uh, three projects are examples of that. Moving into the future, now that the power supply improvement plan has been approved by the Public Utilities Commission, we're going to be looking to procure a lot more renewables. And as part of that, as part of that portfolio, of course, utility scale renewables are going to be a big part Part of that. So with that, I really thank Rodney for participating in this conversation today and also Jay for having me participate as a co-host. So we thank want you, you so back. much. Yeah. So Rodney, honestly, just one last thing. What do you think of Veronica's performance today? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome, Veronica. <laughs> Very thank polished. Thank you, Rodney. Aloha, thank you. you guys. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate <laughs> thank you. it.